Hey Christ community, this is Tim Spamberg, campus pastor of the Shawnee campus. And Joel Smith, Universal Construction, the general contractor for the new Shawnee campus. And Joel and I are excited because we get to show you the inside of our new building. Construction is underway here in Shawnee, right next to the Planet Fitness off of Shawnee Mission Parkway. And pretty soon there will be a an entrance right behind us to get into our new building. And this is a fun time. We are, we are so committed to this project across campuses. The campus pastors are actually on the construction crew doing construction right now as we speak. And I'm so committed. Joel and I are really like co-general contractors. In well, this. Tim, yeah, assistant to the general contractor, I, th I think is what we yeah, discussed. Co-general contractors on this project. And so let's, let's head in and take a look. So we're right here in the middle of what will be our new lobby, the Shawnee campus. Pretty soon that wall is going to be mostly windows and doors to, to come in. Um, and, and we're right here at, at Joel and I's workstation. This is where Joel and I make all the big decisions together. you got the blueprints right here that show like where the, the Temp. piping is and the... Ah, there you go. That makes sense. So the blueprints, uh, lobby, windows to, to come. Uh, Right, by, right beside us here is going to be the Welcome Center um, at some point, uh, just to, to welcome new people um, in. And we're in the, the worship space uh, now, uh, the place where we'll preach the gospel and sing together as, as the community of God. And actually, oh, we're right here. Bill, what you working on? Hey, Bill. Oh, yeah. I just, uh, just got the motivator going on this droid, so it's, it's back in action. And uh, next, I think my uh, project is the... Flux capacitor. That's my next. I need to calibrate that and get it going. The flux capacitor? Yeah. I, where is that at? I think that's in the restrooms, maybe, Bill. Cool. All right. Check sweet. there. Yeah, okay. great work, Bill. Yeah. So, yeah, in the, the worship space where we'll be worshiping together, lots of space for, for new people. Oh, here's Reed working away. Reed, what you working on? Hey, so I have very bad news, but uh, according to my calculations, this beam has got to go. It's not, it's just not going to last. So, Reed, you're saying we need to remove this. Is, uh, you're sure this isn't structural? I don't know what structural means, but the answer is no. And so it's got to go. It's okay. Gonna... Thanks. Good work, Reed. Don't know how we missed that. Well, it's a worship space. We're actually now walking into the future. Uh, that The building we purchased has uh, about 26,000 total square feet. We're building out 12, which means we're in the 14 that is, is for the future. Future worship space. Future space to, uh, to teach the gospel, to disciple people into the way of Jesus. So this is the future. We're excited about one day finishing the, uh, the entirety of this space. And so now we're coming out of the future and back into the present, into what will be our children's ministry wing. That's, uh, we have tons of kids in, in Shawnee, so we needed lots of children's ministry classrooms. So we have eight classrooms. There's one on either side of me uh, here where we'll get to disciple kids into the way of Jesus. Now here's uh, Andrew and Gabe. What are you guys working on? It's good. It's really good. Uh, hey, guys, make sure not to look at the light too long, all right? Okay. Uh, Thanks, Grandma. Okay, great work, guys. Uh, so the, ch the children's ministry wing, and we're actually in the, like, a children's ministry lobby type space. This is one of the ideas we kind of borrow from Brookside, the way they have some space for families to gather in their children's ministry space. So this is where we'll have some furniture, some space for uh, families to hang out, for kids to play with one another just after church uh, ends. And we're now coming into what is my favorite part of the building, the, the kind of the playroom, and, and uh, where we can have people, uh, kids hang out and play during, uh, during the week or during service or in between, and adults can hang out and, and talk with one another. And so we're, we're excited, and we're excited about this building, your generosity, and just want to say thank you for all that you've done to help make this, this possible. And if I could ask you, the, the, the primary thing to pray for in this season is to pray for Sunday, August 16th as a public launch to welcome uh, our community into our, our church family. And so let's pray together around that and speaking together. Let's, I'm going to go grab the rest of the campus. Pastor Joel Wing and take over. Great. Well, thanks, Christ community. I hope you enjoyed your first look at the new Shawnee campus. Um, just want to make sure everyone understands the campus pastors have absolutely nothing to do um, with the building of this building. I gave them vests and hard hats, and they literally will not leave this space. What did you say, Joel? Oh, hey, Reed. I was just actually letting everybody know how great of a job you and the other campus pastors yeah. were yeah. doing. Hey, Joel. Good to know. All right, no, literally, Joel, thank you and your amazing team for all the work you have already done here at the Shawnee campus. And uh, Christ Community, thank you. Thank you for all the ways you support uh, our multi-site mission here at Shawnee, at our downtown campus. Uh, please continue to pray and to give generously uh, as we move this mission forward with God's help. 
Uh, okay, speaking of uh, moving the mission forward, we got a lot more work to get done. Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Come on, guys. Let's, let's, yeah, let's do it. Welcome Christ Community Church online. I am coming to you from the new lobby of the Shawnee campus, where one day people will be drinking coffee, eating donut holes here. I couldn't be more excited to be coming to you from this place. And so far, thanks to God, we have stayed on time in our construction process. So keep praying for that. Keep praying for the workers, for the materials to be completed. God's been incredibly gracious to us. So continue to pray for that. And if you want to stay connected with what's going on and see the progress of the building, Go and like our Facebook page in Shawnee. We're going to keep posting photos of the progress, which if you just saw the video um, in the waiting room part for the service, you could already see a incredible amount of progress has already been done. So go like our Facebook page and see the progress in real time. And then also, hey, just come down and drive along Shawnee Mission Parkway, park in our parking lot and spend time praying for the people we hope will come and meet Jesus in this Space And so it's fun to be here. Uh, one day we'll be having services here, but for now we're having our service online. And so it's never been easier to invite someone to church than it is right now. And so go and share the service on social media, text a friend maybe to invite them to, to join us together. And hey, if you're new, if you're just now beginning to, to connect with Christ Community, there's a link below to click to fill out a connect card. That way we can get to know you, connect with you. Um, and also below our prayer card links as well. We have a lot of time to pray for one another right now. And so we would love to do that. Fill out the card and that way we can know how to best pray for you as a church. The big announcement uh, today is the same as last week. We just want to encourage you to, if you're not in one or if you're in one, uh, to be a part of a community group right now that as good as this experience is maybe to view a service on a screen, we need that interaction. We need to be prayed for and we need to pray for others. And so if you're not in a community group, click the link, go and join and sign uh, up for one. We'll be reaching out to you. Or if you're in a group, we encourage your group to embrace the awkwardness of Zoom community and do it because we need the support with one another. Well, it's time to gather together in uh, worship now. And so just take a moment, take a deep breath. It's okay if your kids are running around. Uh, text someone that you miss that you normally might sit by and let them know you miss them. And let's prepare our hearts together before God in worship.
church, it's good to be with you today. This next song we're going to sing has become one of our favorites at the downtown campus where I lead. It's called Waymaker. And this song is really a reminder that our God is the God that solves impossible circumstances. That's a picture that we see all throughout scripture. We see it when God rescued the Israelites out of Egypt. We see it when Jesus healed people who couldn't see and couldn't walk. And most of all, we see it when Jesus rose from the dead, when everybody thought that all hope was lost. And that's the story that we celebrated last week. If you're like me, it's not hard to think of those impossible circumstances in your own life. It's not hard to think of those places where you feel like you're stuck between two impossible bad options. But today, church, I want us to hear the words of God when he says to us, be still and know that I am God. You see, friends, we can rest, not because we know exactly what will happen in our lives in the future, but because we know exactly who God is. He's the way maker. So let's worship him for that.
Father, we thank you that you are our light and you are our guide. We know that you are always working and moving, though at times it may be hard to see and it may be hard to understand. Help us to cling to you and know you as our good shepherd, for you lead us to peace and you restore our souls. God is my shepherd, and I am his little lamb. He feeds me, he guides me, 
He looks after me. I have everything I need. Inside, my heart is very quiet. As quiet as lying still in soft green grass, in a meadow, by a little stream. Even when I walk through the dark, scary, lonely places, I won't be afraid, because my shepherd knows where I am. He is here with me. He keeps me safe. He rescues me. He makes me strong and brave. He is getting wonderful things ready for me, especially for me, everything I ever dreamed of. He fills my heart so full of happiness, I can't hold it all inside. Wherever I go, I know God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love will go too. Well, I still remember it so clearly, the backseat of the car, the dark parking garage. I was probably six or seven years old, and we had been uh, shopping at the mall that night. I think we were looking for shoes or something. And, but I mean, you remember when we used to go places, when we actually used to go shopping at stores? Well, we had been there that night, and while we were there in the store, I lost what for my six-year-old self was my most precious possession that I had. It was a, a gray stuffed dog that had been kind of my, my lovey, my toy that I had, had loved for many years. And somehow in the store, I'd lost it. I remember getting back to the car and realizing I didn't have it. I still remember that moment, just the fear, the panic that came over me in that moment. And uh, this is the only picture I could find of it, but this dog that I had. And when we got to the car and I realized I didn't have it, that, that sense of what I now know, I didn't have language for it then, but what I now know is grief began to wash over me. And you know, grief is the right response to loss. Grief is the right response to loss. And we have all lost something in the midst of this. And some of us have lost many things, in fact, whether that's a sense of control or kind of knowing what's going to happen in the future. Some of us have lost income. Maybe we've lost uh, hopes for retirement. Uh, for others of us, we've, we've lost our high school graduation or maybe our college graduation. We've, we've lost our plans for the future maybe our health, maybe for some of us, even the life of a loved one to death. We're all grieving something, but maybe we haven't had a chance yet to actually call it that, to name it grief. But friends, when we begin to name things, we can start to tame them. And shortly after the crisis began, Harvard Business Review published an interview with an expert on grief titled, That Discomfort You're Feeling is Grief. And listen to this. Does this resonate with you? Uh, the author writes this. We're feeling a number of different griefs. We feel the world has changed. Just as going to the airport is forever different from how it was before 9-11, things will change. The sense of normalcy, the fear of economic toil, the loss of connection, this is hitting us and we're grieving collectively. We're not used to this kind of collective grief in the air. And whether you're a Christian or not, and whether or not you're in Kansas City or joining us from somewhere across the country, grief drains us. It saps our strength. It makes us feel numb, alone, angry, anxious, afraid. And when we're in the midst of that ache of grief, we long to be restored. As we turn to Psalm 23, our passage for this morning, we discover a good shepherd who meets us in our grief who is with us in the darkest valley, and who is able to restore our souls, to restore our life, to revive your life. And no matter who you are, no matter what you've lost, no matter what the virus has taken from you, if there's one thing I hope you take away from this morning, it's this, you have a good shepherd and he can restore your soul. You have a good shepherd and he can restore your soul your soul. And what we're going to see this morning in Psalm 23 is just that, but that's also going to be the entire theme of this new message series we're beginning today. And each week we're going to ask Jesus to restore us, to restore our peace, to restore our joy and trust, our courage and our hope. And each week we're going to learn to pray a psalm together. Now I know it looks like if you see that word written out, it looks like you should say it, psalms. Uh, but the P on the front there is silent. So it's just Psalms. And what are the Psalms? Well, they're simply a collection of poems, of, of prayers, sung prayers of God's people throughout history. And whether you're a person of faith or not, the language of prayer 
is not natural to anyone. We have to learn to pray. We must learn the language of prayer. And there's no better guidebook for us in learning the language of prayer than the Psalms. The Psalms are a collection of tools to teach us to pray. There, there's a tool, a psalm for each situation in life, right? There are in the Psalms, there's sort of Psalms that are like tape measures that allow us to, to measure and take stock of what God has done, who he is and to praise him and to give him thanks for it. There are Psalms that are like chisels, prayers of confession and repentance that work away at our rough edges. Uh, there are Psalms that are a lot more like, like hammers that are, that are crying out for, for justice, for God to fix things, for, for us in the midst of our lament and our grief. All these and more are waiting for you in the toolbox of the Psalms, teaching you to pray. And this morning, as we look at Psalm 23, I invite you to take a deep breath right now. Seriously, I want you to do that right where you are, wherever you're watching this. Kids, you can do this too. Just even close your eyes and just take a deep breath right now. You have a good shepherd and he can restore you. You have a good shepherd and he can restore you. And here's what we're going to see. We're going to see my good shepherd, he leads me to still waters. He's with me in the dark valleys and he gives me victory at his table. And the first thing we see is the good shepherd's provision as he leads me to still waters. And the Psalm opens with the line, the Lord is my shepherd. And again, the Psalms are poetry. They're inviting us to use our imaginations. And this Psalm is inviting us to imagine ourselves, God's people as sheep. (laughs) Imagine yourself as a sheep helpless, vulnerable, not super bright. That's how the Bible regularly describes you and me as human beings, right? It's not not super flattering, right? Old or young, rich or poor, sick or well, we are all like sheep. But the good news is that we're not helpless and alone. You have a good shepherd and he invites you to still waters, to green pastures, a life without lack a life that you were created for, the life that we long for, the garden life of Eden. And for a sheep, it doesn't get any more garden of Eden-like than green pastures and still waters. And the best shepherds, they lead their flocks to a place where they can lay down and rest. And there is an abundant provision all around. The, The sheep don't have to go around wandering endlessly, searching for rest. It's all right there for them. And that's what your good shepherd does for you. You don't have to go around wandering. Here, God has provided for you a place of abundant provision. He restores your life. He restores your soul. Listen to these verses. Verse one, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And that line, he restores my soul. That's what we're building this whole teaching series on. And to restore in this context, it means to to refresh, to bring back to life, to liveliness, vitality. And the other key word there is that, that language of soul. It's the Hebrew word nefesh, which literally means throat or breath. It doesn't just refer to some sort of immaterial spiritual part of us, but to the very essence of our life or even our physical breath. I love how... Hebrew poetry scholar Robert Alter describes this section in the psalm. He says this, the image is of someone who has almost stopped breathing and is revived, brought back to life. Uh, How many of you at some point in your life have have done CPR and, and rescue breathing training, right? How many of us have done that? Lots of us. And if you've done that, you've been trained in the sort of the most literal sense, the most literal meaning of what it means to restore someone's soul. The picture is you have someone who's who has stopped breathing, their heart has stopped beating and you begin to give those compressions and give those breaths and they restore, they revive, they come back to life. And the author of this Psalm, this prayer, David, King David is saying, that's what the good shepherd does for me every day. He renews my life. He restores my strength. He lets me catch my breath. 
But Psalm 23 uh, is one of those psalms often that if we have a sense of memory to it or if we're familiar with it at all, it's often in the context of funerals, right? This is a psalm that often is said at funerals and it is a psalm that is deeply comforting in times of death. But Psalm 23 is not just a psalm for death. In fact, first and foremost, it is a psalm for life. And Jesus, our good shepherd, picks up on that shepherd metaphor in the Gospel of John. And he speaks these words in in John chapter 10. Jesus says this, he says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and may have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You see, Jesus came not only so you could go to heaven one day when you die, but that you could have life, life abundant, even more than you would normally expect or anticipate now, today. And friends, we go through different seasons as people, but God does not change. His provision is always green always alive, always abundant, always available, and not just later, sometime in the future, but now, today, for you. He offers us a life without lack. But that life is not found in a what. It's not found in a job or in physical health. It's found in a who. That life without lack is not found in a what, but in a who. And it's to the presence of that who that David turns to next in the psalm, because not only does my good shepherd lead me to still waters, he is also with me in the darkest valley. Because verse three of the psalm ends with this promise that God will lead us in paths of righteousness. The idea there is that he's leading us in the, the right path, the best way. But the reality is that sometimes that path takes us through deep, dark valleys. And we feel that globally right now, don't we? We are in a very dark valley. And and again, now imagine yourself as a sheep and you reach to, in order to reach that place of green pasture, that place of still water, you have to go through a dark valley to get there. And I love this this painting um, by the landscape artist, this German-American landscape artist, Albert Bierstadt. It's called A Storm in the Rocky Mountains. And in the land of Israel, the shepherd led their sheep, not not through wide Rocky Mountain valleys, but through tight, dark, shadow-filled slot canyons called wadis, where any number of dangers from animal predators to flash floods to violent attackers might lurk. And in a wadi, that dark valley is a place that no sheep could or should ever feel safe unless, unless, Their good shepherd is with them. And then they have nothing to fear. Verse four, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And that line, that line, you are with me, that is the beating heart at the center of the psalm that gives it life and energy to the whole prayer. The idea is just that all throughout pulsing through the psalm is, you are with me, you are with me, you are with me, you are with me. It's the heartbeat of the shepherd's presence that, is, that lets us not only enjoy a life without lack, but lets us enjoy a life without fear. And I don't know about you, but I cannot remember a time in my life where there have been more moments where I felt a deeper sense of fear or uncertainty than lately. And one night in particular was, was really hard. It was actually like 1 a.m. on Monday morning, March 23rd. I remember it because it was the day before the stay-at-home order began here in Kansas City. My wife, Rachel, who gave me permission to share this story, she woke me up with this dead look of panic in her eyes. Uh, she, was, she was terrified. And she wouldn't let me turn the lights off in our room for hours after that. And and in turn, I was afraid because I, married for almost 10 years, had never seen her like that. Never seen her like that. And the rolling waves of what we later realized were were panic attacks continued to, to break over her all throughout the next day, paralyzing her with fear, almost unable to move. 
And the only thing that sustained her and me in the midst of those, those repeated kind of waves of panic that came throughout that day was her saying aloud to herself again and again, Jesus is here, Jesus is here, Jesus is here. And she told me later, kind of after all that had passed, that in the midst of those panic attacks, when she felt like she was losing control, when she felt like she was literally like losing her mind, that the one thing that she could count on, the one that she, that she could cling to and that grounded her in those moments is the reality that Jesus is here. Friends, you have a good shepherd and he is with you always, even in, especially in those darkest of valleys. And friends, the darkest valley that any of us face that was going to be the valley of the shadow of death. And the global death toll from COVID-19 has already surpassed 100,000. But every one of us has to face the reality of the shadow of death, even if we never get the coronavirus. So the question is, have we really prepared for that moment? Have we looked that moment in the face? Every religion, every philosophy, every worldview, whether it's atheistic or theistic or agnostic, it has to wrestle with the question of what happens when I die? What happens when I die? And the naturalistic answer to that question is, is nothing, right? That we simply cease to exist, that we never were more and would never amount to be more than simply a collection of cells, a, a bag of bones and water that's just returning to the elements. On the other end, a, a very different answer to that question is, a more Eastern answer is maybe something like in Tibetan Buddhism, where you have the sense that, that death is just part of an endless cycle of life and death and reincarnation, and where your reincarnation is is affected by how you lived your current life. Those are two very different answers, but they both have one thing in common, and that is that they say that death is just something that's natural. It's something we have to accept as part of the natural process of things. But Christians, however, declare loudly and forcefully that death is not natural. Death is not the way it's supposed to be. And the great hope of Christianity is not to say, oh, you know, death is no big deal. No, the great hope of Christianity, Christianity says death is a monster. Death is a lion hiding in the shadows, waiting to savage the vulnerable sheep. And our great hope is not someday in some kind of circle of life, lion king kind of thing, where our sheep ancestors eat the lion after he's died and fed the grass. No, the great hope of Christianity is that we have a good shepherd who has slayed the lion, who has destroyed the monster once and for all, my good shepherd has gone before me in death and he is with me now and he will be with me in my death and he will hold me tight and never, ever, ever let me go. Our good shepherd declares this, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who believes and li lives and believes in me shall never die. And Jesus asks, do you believe this? Friends, do you believe this? Have you believed this? Do you still believe this? You have a good shepherd. He is with you even in the darkest valleys, even in death. And he invites you to the table of his victory because my good shepherd gives me victory at his table. As 20, Psalm 23 comes to a close, David shifts the metaphor slightly. Here, we imagine ourselves no longer as sheep, but as guests of honor at a royal victory feast. Right? Picture the great feast at Hogwarts Castle. That's the image, this abundant feast, just full of all the good things that you could imagine or want. A, a, a cup that's overflowing with abundance and joy, life that never ends, anointed with oil. Again, this is a picture of luxurious provision. Maybe you've at some point in your life been on a, a long international flight and you know about the time the plane's getting ready to land, they might come around with those, those hot towels to lay over your face, to give you refreshment. That's the idea of this anointing with oil. This is a celebration, a victory celebration, a table set in the presence of the enemies. The idea is that we're sitting in the presence of the enemies who have been utterly defeated. This is a victory celebration and the defeated enemies can only look on helpless to ever harm you 
again. And again, our ultimate enemy is death. And sin that kept us in bondage to death. But Jesus has forgiven your sins. He has broken the bonds. He has defeated the enemy. The enemy, the evil one who came to steal and destroy, he has been defeated. And now, therefore, death no longer has any hold on you. And Pastor Tim Keller, in his newest book, simply titled On Death, writes this. I love this. Poet George Herbert says, Death used to be an executioner but the gospel makes him just a gardener. I love that. Death used to be an executioner, but the gospel makes him just a gardener. Death used to be able to crush us, but now all death can do is plant us in God's soil. So we become something extraordinary. And that friends is the victory the good shepherd gives you at his table. And so now there's only one question that remains for you. And it's this, will you join in singing the song? Will you join in singing the song? Millions of people around the world today, across thousands of different, uh, thousands of years from a myriad of languages and ethnicities and cultures, they have placed their trust in the good shepherd and added their voice to the massive choir who is singing the song day and night without end. Will you join them? You know, as we study the Psalms, when we read the Psalms, we have to look not only at the Psalm itself, but where the Psalm fits in the collection. What comes before it and after it? And what comes before? In Psalm 22, that Psalm begins with these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 24, after it, opens with these words, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it, right? One is a cry of desperation and loneliness in a world that is not as it ought to be. The other is a confident declaration of God's magnificent rule over a good world. And friends, they are both true. And it's Psalm 23 that is the bridge that gets us from one to the other that lets us sing both Psalm 22 and Psalm 24. So will you join the chorus? Will you ask him to restore your soul? And I'd encourage you this week to memorize Psalm 23 if you haven't. It's poetry. It's designed to be memorized. It's, and it's relatively short. Take some time each day. Read over it again and again. Memorize it. Make it your own. Work it deeply into your heart and into your mind. Make it your own. And imagine if we were a community of people who had that psalm memorized who sang this song, who prayed this prayer, who really, really believed it. What kind of community would that create? What would that do for our offices, our workplaces, our church, our neighborhoods, our families? We would become a deeply non-anxious presence. Still waters for the others around us who are in the midst of fear. We would be able to be just overflowing with generosity because we have known the green pastures of the Good Shepherd. We would rest fearlessly because our Good Shepherd is with us. So will you join? And there's only one way to join. You can only sing this song because Jesus has sung it over you first. So come to your good shepherd who has laid down his life for the sheep, who has left the green pastures, who has gone out into the desert wilderness to be tempted, who from the cross said, I thirst, who was cast out of the house of the Lord so that you and I could dwell there securely forever. Come to the one who lost everything so that in him, everything you lost could be restored to you. You know, that evening so many years ago, as my young self sat in the back of that car, overwhelmed with grief at the loss of that precious stuffed animal. My mom comforted me. My dad went back into the mall to look for it. And after what seemed like a lifetime to a little boy, my dad returned and brought me Greyhound, that precious stuffed toy. I still have today. 
And if my parents who love me so much, if they, if they could go and search out and restore something as simple as a stuffed dog. Friends, how much more will your crucified, risen and reigning savior, your good shepherd, be able to restore your soul? Join the choir, sing the song. And that's how I want us to close right now is for us to, to say this psalm together, to say it out loud. And it's gonna be on the screen. So let's, let's say this together, read it aloud with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And today we get to celebrate communion together. We get to come to the table of victory together. And when we come to communion, we come to the table of our good shepherd, our victorious King. We come to a table prepared for us in the presence of our enemies. We come to a table of hope, a table of provision, of green pastures, of still waters. And we come asking him once again, to restore our souls. And if you're a follower of Jesus and you have communion elements and would like to participate, this would be a great time to do so. And if you need to, to pause for some additional time, you can just pause the service right here and do that. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And in the same way, he took a cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you're ready, take and eat.
It was wonderful to worship with you today. And I hope that you'll just take a few moments to continue to think about how your Good Shepherd not only guides you, cares for you, loves you, protects you, but more than anything, He restores you. Take a moment to reflect and pray on that. Share the words that He's given to you with others that are staying in your home or perhaps part of your greater community. And if you need to, reach out to us with your prayer request use our online component, or reach out to one of our campus pastors. We want to be praying with you in this season. And families, if you want to continue this conversation about the Good Shepherd with your children, please go to our online resource for families and follow up with the questions that we have provided for you there. We're going to take another moment to sing again, but I want to end this time by praying over you these words from Hebrews 13. We've been the church gathered, and now we are becoming the church scattered on mission. So receive these words by raising your hand. Now may the Lord God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the good sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory and the honor forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Before we end this morning, we're going to sing one more song of worship together. And it's a song that reminds us of God's faithfulness and his goodness and how it follows us all the days of our lives. So let's sing this together and celebrate that. Oh, my days I've been held in 
Good.